All right, turn my phone off there. Shall I leave it right here in case somebody's got to tell us something? <clears throat> okay, I think I am. Uh, think I'm ready. We're going. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to give it just a second to come on and make sure our audio is working. We've got a a uh, sound man who is and video man filling in tonight with Aiden. So we're going to see if it is okay. Jeffrey's got it on on his phone, so we're going to give him just a second to see if the live if he's picking up uh, audio on the live version. Has it come through yet, Jeffrey? He is. He's a staring at it. So I'm going to pull mine up right quick just to see. Usually we got Big Mike checking it for us there. So it's running. What about yours, Deanne? You got there yet or no? It's on. You got you got audio, and you've got audio, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. Then we are good to go. Then. All right, so we'll get started. This will be lesson number 10. So the first nine are on the website. We've taken a little over a month off. We'll be on Thursday nights through this month, through the first week in February. Then we will go back to Mondays. So uh, hopefully that won't be too big of an inconvenience to everybody. But uh, we had the last two weeks we were together, we started studying in chapter 2 on the seven churches. Now, you can look up there and you can see, it's, it's, it's an older map, but you can see wherever there's a square, you can see where the seven churches are located in that area that's called Asia Minor there. So you've got uh, Pergamos, you've got Thyatira, Philadelphia, Sardis, Ephesus, uh, Laodicea, let's see, one, two, Smyrna, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't know why it says Pergamum, it's Pergamus. So, uh, some maps are, sir. It's not. Okay, well, put it on me for now. And, okay, and then um, if you need to make a call, let's see, EJ will probably not answer right now. He, uh, wait a minute, what time is their game? He, uh, hold on a second. It was going to be at six. You can give him a call and try him, okay? He might be done by now, may not, I don't know. But you can kind of play with it, see if you can get it. If not, it'll just stay on me and we'll be okay for tonight. Okay. There we go. All right, we are getting through it. So, uh, number 10, the third church that we are going to study, we'll start in verse 12, is in Pergamos there. So, we'll jump over here. We're in Revelation chapter 2. Before we do that, there was a seven-point outline that we gave you that's alliterated with the letter R, that every message to every church is you can follow this outline in it. And there's seven points in it. Number one, it says you identify the revelator. Who is the revelator? Who is being revealed in the book of Revelation? Jesus, right. Okay. So Jesus is the revelator. Who is each of these books or letters or messages written to? Well, it's close. It's a trick question. Because specifically, if you look, look at verse 12, and to the angel of the church. So we just made that designation that it is written to these angels. These angels have such a role during this time period, during the uh, tribulation period, versus where they do not have the same role where they do today. So they are the recipient, but it is the church as well. But specifically, it's to that angel. Uh, then you would have the review. You'll go down verse 13. You see right there it says, I know thy works. He repeats that each time. And after he says, I know thy works, then there is a reproof. That's number four. You got the revelator, the recipient, the review. Then there's a reproof. He looks at that church and tells them where they're struggling and what correction and instruction they need. And then he gives them a remedy. 
He uses that statement, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. So he gives them the remedy, tells them what they need to do. And then there's that phrase, to him that overcometh. That's the reward. And then, um, actually, to him that overcometh is the reward. The reminder is, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So we'll see those things as we go through this. I don't know. There's, several, there's a lot to cover in this one. And I don't know that we'll get through the whole thing tonight. And uh, we'll, we'll just get as far as we need to get tonight and hold up there. But we've seen the map. We see where the churches are. And remember this. You've got seven different churches. These seven churches, these messages written, they're specifically to those churches, but they're for all the people going through the tribulation period. Just like Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians was written to those churches, But those messages in Scripture are all for us, all of us that are going through the age of grace. So it's the same program, it's the same format that you see there. So what you're reading in through this, and remember this, this is important. If we go back to chapter 1, I was just reading back through and familiarizing myself fresh and anew with Revelation. I encourage you guys to do that. If you're going to come to the studies, try to find some time during the week to read at least part of the book of Revelation. Read a chapter before, chapter after. It'll just help you as we're going through because you become familiar with things. You may not understand everything that you see and that you read, but as I'm teaching through it, if you're familiar with it, it helps you to process it better. So that's a good good thing to do there. Uh, I'm trying to think, where did I see that when he says, "I"? oh, here it is. Verse, look at verse 9 right up here, back in chapter 1. I, John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember, John got, was over on the isle of Patmos. He was there for what? For the testimony of Jesus Christ. Some people say he was there because he was exiled there and he was in trouble. But there's really nothing in history that says that. You see, when you look at this, when it says companion in tribulation, it was not just talking about the tribulation he was going through presently in his life. He was talking about the tribulation that he was going to write about and that he was delivering. He believed that he was going to go through this tribulation period in his lifetime. And we, don't, we won't bring the timeline out tonight. Uh, we'll review it some next week. But remember, John, as he wrote this, believed that in his lifetime, Christ would go back to heaven, and then he would return, and the 70th week of Daniel, the seven years of tribulation would happen. He would go through it, and he would be in the kingdom, and he would be one of the 12 sitting upon the 12 thrones. Remember this, in Acts chapter 2, actually it's over in Acts chapter 1. Let me me show you this. We won't get sidetracked too much, but look at this right over here. I want to make sure that you see it. One of the things that they did in Acts chapter 1 is, look in verse 13, when they were come in, they went up into an upper room, these are the disciples, where abode Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. And they all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of of the disciples and said, the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Now this is talking about Judas Iscariot. He's already killed himself and it talks about that. What they have to do, the next step they take is they have to elect another disciple. If we were to scroll on down a little bit, he talks about it. Look at verse 23. They appointed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, Barsabbas, and who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go into his own place. And they gave forth their lots... And the lot fell upon Matthias. Now remember on Wednesday nights, remember we've been studying a little bit about Jonah when they were all on the boat. Remember they cast lots to find out who was the troublemaker and the lot fell upon Jonah. Well, here you see them use, they 
cast lots to find out who God wants to choose to be that 12th disciple. Well, why is it so important that they have a 12th disciple right there? Because the kingdom was still available. They were still thinking that in their lifetime, they were going to go through the tribulation, all these events that we're studying, and that Christ would come set up his kingdom upon the earth in their lifetime. As you go through, it's just very important for you to understand those things and get a hold of that and have that perspective as you're reading it. Most of the commentaries and the way people look at this, you know, I read some today and I... I, I read a little bit and just stopped because what they were saying, they were trying to say this time period refers to like A.D. 325 up to 500 and something. It represents that historical period of time, and that just doesn't make sense. So, But they can't see it the other way, so they got to see it some way, so they got to write something in their commentary, so they just write down what they think, and they're wrong. But they mean well. All right, so with that, let's go back to uh, Revelation chapter 2 here. So, we'll get back to this church, the third church here in Pergamos, all right? So, with that, we'll read verses 12 and 13. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp, the sharp sword with two edges. Now, remember, the first thing is the revelator. The first thing we see here is who it's written to, the revelator. That's, and what, when it talks about having the sharp sword with two edges, where is that a reference back to first? Remember in chapter 1, and it's been a while, some of you may not remember this, but remember in chapter 1, you get this description of, of Christ there, of him in his glorified state. Look here in chapter 1. And um, verse 12 here, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a, two -edged, with a, went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So whenever it makes a, whenever he writes to one of these seven churches, he makes a different reference back to one of the characteristics of what he saw when he saw Christ in his glorified state. So, and we've looked at that a little bit, but we'll look at it in a little bit more detail now. Um, this sharp sword, we see it here in Revelation 1.16. Let's go ahead, we're looking at just, I'll show you just a few places, there's lots of places to look at. We know the Bible says, I think it's Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword there. But if you go over to Revelation 19, when you see Christ in his return here, we'll start reading in verse 11. He says, And I saw heaven open, and, a and behold, a white horse. Now remember this, you see a white horse here? When we get over to chapter 4, chapter 5 in that neighborhood, we're going to see another white horse. There's a white horse that represents the Antichrist, and there's a white horse that represents Christ. The Antichrist is always trying to emulate Christ and trying to make himself like Christ. So don't get confused. There are two different white horses. So this is Christ himself as he returns. White horse, and he that sat upon him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Remember, when Christ returns in his second coming, he's coming back as a warrior. He's coming back as a king on a horse, and he is going to go to war. And his main offensive weapon will be his sword. But here's what you have to remember. Will it be, you know, I remember used to picturing that literal sword coming out of his mouth, but it's, the, it's, it's his voice. It's his spoken word. Remember we talked about in the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth, and he spoke things into existence. When he comes back this second time, what's he going to do? He's going to speak things out of existence. He will speak and if he says something is to be destroyed, it will be destroyed. Just as he could speak and something could be created, he can speak and something could be, could be destroyed. 
So his eyes were as a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, that he should rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And on his vesture and on his thigh, name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. See, what's important for us to study this is to understand we live in the age of grace. There's a lot of bad things that happen. There's a lot of bad things that go on, and sometimes people ask, well, why does God let this happen? Why does God let that happen? During the tribulation period, those seven years, a lot of bad things are going to happen. And then there's going to come a day. All those people that are enduring to the end, that have not taken the mark of the beast, that have, you know, just suffered and gone through all sorts of stuff, they're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And it's almost like, you know, I like movies and stories where the good guy comes in and takes care of business. You know, I remember I, I was watching this one, I think it was one of those little Hallmark movies with my wife. I don't like them Hallmark movies because there's too much drama and everybody just cries and people get hurt and they die and bad stuff happens and it's just everybody's sad. I remember I was watching one with her, I said, where is the good guy at? I said, somebody needs to come in and shoot that dude, beat that dude up, and press the girl and ride off into the sunset. What is the problem here? I said, I do not like this. She said, well, he's da, 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 da. I'm like, I ain't watching these no more. All right. So she watches hers, and I go in, I watch the Long Ranger and Zorro, and I like it when them boys come in, and they whoop the bad guys, take care of business. Well, there's a day coming that the, the earth and those that have waited will be looking, and Jesus is going to come back. And he's not going to come back in a manger. He's not going to come back when, you know, looking like these hippies that they draw in the pictures. And by the way, Christian people didn't make those pictures. They made up those pictures. That's not even what a Jew looked like back during that time. Jews didn't have the long hair. They had the beard. Look what a Jew looks like today. Go over to Israel, look at the Jew. And so, but the, you got all these people that make all these little sissy pictures of Jesus. This is far from sissy. <laughs> he's going to come back, and people are going to be so scared. They're just going to fall over. He's going to speak. And, I mean, Babylon, I've told you, Babylon's going to be, that whole city's going to be annihilated one day by the power of his voice. And then he's got all those angels behind him, all those warriors coming behind him there. It is going to be a sight to see. But his voice, his word, that word... As a sword there, it will be used as a sword to divide and to conquer there. So it's important for you to understand it. The emphasis is not on the sword itself. The sword is the representation of his mouth and of the power of his spoken word there. So it's important that you, that you see that and understand why there is such an, an emphasis on it there. Go back, let me show you another verse in the New Testament. Second, um, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul is teaching the difference between the rapture and the second coming. He's trying to get the churches to understand the difference there. Um, let's see, verse 8 here. It says, And then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders there. So you're going to have the Antichrist, and we're going to see some of this in this passage. The Antichrist is going to be indwelt by Satan himself. Satan will be upon the earth in specific places. Remember, Satan can't be everywhere all the time like God is. He doesn't have those attributes. And we're going to see some things. If you were to, if we go back over here into our Revelation chapter 2, if you look back at verse 9, we looked at this a while back uh, when the, the church before in uh, Smyrna. He says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now we know what a synagogue is. It was the temple. It was where the Jews met. And under that program, that's where they would come together and have their sacrifices and do all those different things there, met and be taught. 
You know, we get down here into Revelation chapter 2, look in verse 13. He says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. What do you think Satan's seat is? What does he want to be? What is Satan, what's, what's the Antichrist going to set himself up as in the tribulation period? Guess. God. And also, with being, he wants himself to be God. He also wants himself to be king. Satan's seat is where his throne will be. You have the synagogue of Satan. You have Satan's seat. And he says where it is, And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in the days where Antipas, Antipas, no, it's Antipas, was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So, that's another aspect of studying through this, is you have to realize that during this time period, Satan is going to be upon the earth in places. He is going to indwell the Antichrist there, and he will be in a bodily form. See, we're, as we go through, we're going to see a battle that takes place at the three-and-a-half-year point. It's very critical. It's very important, and we'll look at it several times as we go through the study. But the battle goes on up in the heavens. And what's interesting is we're already in the heavens at that point. You see, the rapture takes place. We go up to the judgment seat. We're judged and we're up in the heavens for all eternity. But while we're there, these events are going on on the earth. And what's cool about that is, is that you've got good guys and bad guys up in the heavens. You've got angels and you've got those demons. And there's going to be a battle that takes place and all those demonic forces and Satan himself are going to be cast down to the earth at about the three and a half, about the halfway through the tribulation period. And then he is going to be here upon the earth. And that's when the great tribulation takes place. We'll get to all those things as we study through it. But then what's cool about that is all those positions. The Bible says we are going to judge angels one day. Well, when all the bad guys are gone and all the angel, good angels are left up there, then what's left to do? It's for us and them to go out and rule and reign and establish the kingdoms of the heavens. You see, that's why you live for the Lord today. Obviously, we live for the Lord because we love him, because he died for us, but as far as the motivation of a reward, he has an extensive plan for us in what we're going to do for him. Thus, that's why we study. That's why we try to do right. We're in church. We try to obey the Bible, and we study the Bible so we can understand these things. Even though we're not going to go through all this stuff, it helps us to understand the Lord and the things of God as we understand those things that are going to come there. So, back to this. So, you've got Satan who's going to be upon the earth there. But back to, uh, let's go back here to verse 13. I know thy works... And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied uh, my faith, even in those days where Antipas. Antipas, the word anti is, means against, P-A-S, pus, that means everything. Antipas was, his name meant against everything. And obviously he was martyred. He was probably called that, representing the fact that he was against everything that the Antichrist was doing. If you, re long time ago, you know, <laughs> over a month ago, but if you go back to the church right before there, and we look in um, verse, uh, verse 10, he says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We talked about how that's one of the things the Antichrist and that government's going to do is they will imprison people who won't take the mark of the beast. They'll imprison them for 10 days. And after those 10 days, they may torture them. They may just make them look forward. They may give them opportunity and try to get them to bow down to the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast. And if they don't, they're going to take them out. Anybody remember the form of execution that's going to take place during that time? What's going to happen? They're going to be beheaded. So they're probably during that time, they're going to see other people get beheaded maybe. But that is what's going to happen. So here in Pergamos, when it talks about Antipas, 
he was probably one of those that was in prison for 10 days and was probably beheaded because he would not take the mark and would not conform to the Antichrist there. So, um, then you get into verse 14. And he says, but I have a few things against thee. So here's the reproof. He's like, okay, here, he, he tells the good things they're doing. I know thy works. Where thou dwellest, you dwell in a hard place. You're right there where the Antichrist is. And thou holdest fast my name. You've not denied the faith. And even in the midst of seeing someone martyred, and this, this fellow, I believe it was a person that was just martyred because of his belief there. But then he says, I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, Wednesday nights, Pastor Payne has been talking a lot about Baal worship and Balaam and things of that nature. Well, what we're going to see as we study through this, Baal worship, is going to be what the Antichrist is going to utilize to proclaim himself to be God. You know, through the years, people have tried to say, well, it's, it's the Catholic Church. Well, it's, it, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. And they try to relate it to things of today. But really, you can look in the, you can look in the Bible itself. Balaam, that's, you know, that's, you know, you get the word Baal out of that there. And there's two people we're going to see that are warned against. There's two spirits and two people and two ways about them that we're going to see in these churches. One is Balaam and the other is Jezebel. Those two are brought back and the way that they operated in history, what they did back then, that is going to be something that is going to be used in the future during the seven years of tribulation. And Balaam, we'll look at him right now. We won't get through all of it tonight, but we'll look at a little bit of it. But I'm going to give you a section that I'd like for you to read uh, this week, and it'll help you so we don't have to cover it in so much detail. But it's actually an interesting part of the Bible, and it'll help you to understand what we're, um, what we're doing right here. But let's read this verse. I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So, there, and I want to show you, I'm going to give you a, a little quick lesson here, because let's say we wanted to go back and find Balaam and Balak in the Bible. So, I want you to watch up here. If I go to my search, and I type in B-A-L-A-C, and I search for it, how many verses are there? One. Okay. Now, if I was to type in Balaam, well, there's a lot of those, but as I am reading through some of those, look at 2218, if you can make that out. Look how Balak is spelled in the Old Testament. What's the difference? What is it, Helen? Did you see it? It's a K, right? So in the New Testament, it's a C. In the Old Testament, it's a K. Does anybody know why? Has to do with a, a proper name. Like, if my name was John, if I went to a Spanish-speaking country, what would my name be? Anybody know? What would they call me? Who? Juan. J-U-A-N. The name Juan is the same as John. In Spanish, it's Juan, spelled different, pronounced different. In English, it is John. So what they do when you've got the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, sometimes the proper names are spelled different because they're names. So they get translated that way. So that's why they're spelled different. So I just wanted, just in case, that's just something you have to remember when you're searching for a name from the New to Old Testament. It's not always that way, but sometimes it is that way. So you have got this issue with Balaam and Balak, and it talks about the doctrine, the teaching of Balaam there. And Balaam is going to represent one of the most powerful things the Antichrist will use during the tribulation period 
will be, and it's used even today, it's that of religion. Organized religion where man is exalted and the truth of God is either compromised or it's done away with and man begins to exalt himself above God. And that's what happened with Balaam and Balak there. Balaam is a prophet of God. Balak was a king there. Let me show you a warning in Jude 11 here that's given about religion during that time. Jude 11. It says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Who's Cain? Who's Cain related to? Who? Abel. Abel. Right. So that's the Cain we're talking about. It says, And ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Now think about that for a minute. Woe unto them. Now Jude is part of that Hebrews through Revelation written to those going through the tribulation period. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. The question would be, what does Cain and Balaam have in common? Well, if we back up to Cain, Cain came, and this goes way back. If you were here and we studied Genesis, you got Cain and Abel, and they're going to come and they're going to bring an offering. And we, you, most of y'all know that story. Cain, you know, Abel brought what? What did Abel bring as an offering back in Genesis, first offering? What was it, Huddy? Yeah, he, he, Abel brought the sheep. Cain was the one that brought the fruits, bought the best of his fruits and all that stuff. So one brought a sacrifice. One bought, brought the best of what he could do. And see, one, and they both knew what they were supposed to bring. God, you know, God had instructed them. But Cain was unwilling to be instructed. He says, I'm going to do it. He said, basically, I'm going to come and please God my way. That's what religion does. When a person says, I want to be good enough to get to heaven, well, that's incorrect. That's religion. We can't be good enough. We have to put our faith and trust in what Christ did. But religion says, no, I'm going to get to God how I want to. Back in the book of Genesis, when they built that, the, um, the tower of what? What was it called? Babel, right? And it's called that because they were going, they were babbling because he changed all of their languages there. And you've got those things where people are trying to get to God on their own. And it represented religion. The doctrine of Balaam represents religion. And religion is going to be very powerful because what's the Antichrist going to do? He's going at the halfway year, half, halfway point, he's going to go into that temple and proclaim himself to be God and give a, a desecration. He's going to give an incorrect sacrifice there. So you're going to have all these things going on, but this way of Cain, the way of Cain is the way of religion. It's the way of organized religion. You say, well, Brother Mark, aren't we organized religion? We have a, we have a church and we have some organization. We do. We have a building. We've got things that are organized. We do things in a certain way, but... Here's what's important to remember. We have a pastor, we have deacons, we have members. There's nobody above that. And you know who is above all three of those? It's the Bible. There's no denomination, there's nobody saying that they're above that and telling one, okay, I know the Bible says this, but I say this. Anytime somebody tries to tell other people that God wants them to do something that's contrary to the Bible and they try to use God, that's religion. And there's a lot of lying that goes on in religion. That's why it's important. That, that's why we have Bible studies. That's why we're, even at a young age, we're trying to come and learn these things about the Bible. Even though some of it you may be like, but Mark, I don't know if I understand all this stuff. It's okay. You get, you take in all that you can get because you've got a whole lifetime to try to get a hold of it there. And this is what we are accountable for. And the last thing we want to make out of anybody, of the young people that come to this church, 
are people that are religious. Sometimes people make the statement, if somebody gets saved, they'll say, they got religion. Now, we don't use that term. We say, no, we got saved. We, we were justified. We were declared righteous by, by God based upon the finished work of Christ there. Religion's a mess. Religion will cause people to not believe what the Bible says because they'll believe their religion more than they will believe the Bible there. So... We will, uh, all right, we are right here almost to 7.30. So what we're going to do is the, in Numbers, Numbers 22 through about Numbers 25. Here for just a second here. Where is it at? Find it, find it. Numbers, there it is. Now, Numbers 22. Now, and as you read this in the Bible, you know, sometimes the Bible uses words. Sometimes the Bible will use a word in context to refer to an animal that people will use as a cuss word today, okay? So we know this is what the Bible says, so we're not going to get bothered by it. Usually when I talk about Balaam's donkey, <laughs> I make reference to it as a donkey. But if you read it in this, you are going to see what... Um, what he talked about as, but uh, you can see right there in verse 22, okay? But the story that goes along with this, okay? Everybody can read that and see what I'm talking about. And I don't, I don't want that to be a detriment to what we're trying to cover. That's why I would like for you to read Numbers 22 through 25, because what you're going to see is Balaam, God's man, who will lie and manipulate and do all he can do for power and money, but still try to be the man of God and try to appease those that are wrong. Balak's a wicked king. He's the king of the Moabites. He, want, he basically wants Balaam to curse the children of Israel so he can whoop them. And Balaam, there's certain things God won't let him do, but Balaam, in his subtlety and his wickedness, what he does is he teaches them, this is the doctrine of Balaam, he teaches them how to get God to curse his own people. He says, all you got to do is get them to disobey God. I don't, we don't have to get God to curse them. I don't have to do it. They'll do it to themselves. And that's when they started sending them in and trying to get them to marry, you know, the Israelites to marry in with the Moabites and all that stuff there. And you know, he was teaching them how to do that. It was manipulative, and it was just a godless religion there. But what you see in Numbers 22 through 25, that same mindset is what's going to come over in the tribulation period. And that's what they're going to try to use, and that's why he's teaching against it and wanting them to see it there. So this week, if you get a chance, read Numbers 22 through 25, and, um, you know, read through it a few times, try to get a hold of what's going on there, see who the characters are, see the events that are going on, and we'll start off and talk about that more next week, and we'll get through the end of the, uh, the church in Pergamos there. All right, anybody got any questions? Nope, good. All right, let's pray. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for the ability to study, and Lord, for the opportunity Help us, Lord, to take time this week to read a little bit in Revelation and read some over in Numbers. And, Lord, to be able to understand these things. Lord, as our young people become familiar with it, Lord, that they can read it and then we can teach on it. Lord, it's going to be something to help them to retain it and get a hold of it and understand it in a greater way. Father, give us safety as we travel home in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you guys for coming.